Hello and welcome back to my channel and part two of my introduction to Japanese cinema where I'm going to be going through the history of Japanese film picking out certain directors and certain films not every major director but just certain directors who I'm interested in to give you a way of getting into Japanese film and finding your own way through it. Now today we're reaching the new wave. A lot of people associate the term Nouvelle Vague with France in the 1960s, but many countries had new waves in the 60s. The whole of Eastern Europe, you know, Poland and Czechoslovakia were making incredible films. And Japan had its own new wave that was just as fresh, as vital, as experimental, as different, as challenging as anything coming out of France. Now, whenever people talk about new waves, they always talk about the missing link, don't they? That transitional figure from the classical age into the new age. Where, was, where did the, it, the seeds of it, the prototype of this new wave, come from? Well, in Japan, the missing link figure is Yuzu Kawashima. And he's not a director that's very well known in the West. And unfortunately, I've only ever been able to see two of his films. But those two films tell me everything I need to know. The best of his films is a film called Bakumatsu Taoden. It's got various titles in English, all of which are very poor. The latest one is Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate. That's what it's called in IMDb. What a mouthful that is. Bakumatsu Teoden is how it's known in Japan. Now, this is an extraordinary film. On the surface, it's a classic kind of jidei geiki, a period costume drama set in the world of, you know, the samurai and so forth. And it's about this poor guy, and he goes to a local brothel, and he spends all his money and finds that he's in debt. And the madam de demands that he pays off his debt. And so what he does is he gets involved in all sorts of schemes to try and get the money back. And then by doing so, he gets involved in other people's schemes. Everyone's kind of on the make. And uh, he gets involved in all these... Uh, so it becomes a sort of fast-moving farce as everyone tries to get money and everyone tries to get a little bit of power and, you know, manoeuvre over everyone else. And it's all set within this sort of this sort of brothel house. And it's got the same kind of feel for space and composition and actually movement as Mizuguchi. But it's faster, it's spikier, it's a bit more sardonic, a bit more cynical. And you can feel the classical world of Japanese cinema being dragged into the new world of the 1960s. Similarly, a couple of years later, a few years later, he made a film called Elegant Beast in English, sometimes called Graceful Brute. I prefer Elegant Beast. This is an extraordinary movie. Again, it's all set in an interior. It's all set in this one apartment room, lived in by this family. And again, all the members of this family, they're on the make. You know, the son is embezzling from his firm. The others have all got get-rich screams, and all they're encouraging each other and helping each other to get on. It's like a family of sort of petty criminals. And then other people try to bring them down, but these other people have also got their own little agendas, and they're also on the make. So it's a very cynical, very dark film, but also very funny. It reminded me a lot of um, the old BBC plays for today. In England, we have this tradition of, you know, TV plays, which are often quite interior. If they're not filmed on sets, they're filmed on 16mm camera, dealing with social issues of the day. And I had that kind of feel about it. It was like a sort of Japanese Alan Clark. And what I also like about it is it takes the whole showman geiki genre, you know, looking at the, the, the traditional Japanese family and problems in the family, and it sort of drags it into a sort of nastier, more sarcastic register, which is very funny. It's a kind of upturning of the traditional Japanese family values into something much darker, but also much funnier. So it's well worth checking out if you can find it. Now that film was written by Kaneto Shindo, and he's the second figure I want to look at in this video. Shindo is one of the most important figures in Japanese film, but he's perhaps most important as a screenwriter. He didn't just write Elegant Beast, he wrote so many films. My God, during the 60s, he wrote for Yoshimura, Masamura, Tadashi Imai, Kinugasa, as well as Kawashima. He wrote for every single director in the Shochiku system. Shochiku was a major um, film studio in Japan. He wrote for every single director in that system except for Ozu. Incredible. And then 
even after the 60s, he still kept writing into old age. He was writing in the 70s, 80s, an amazingly prolific writer. And that's probably his most important contribution to Japanese film. But he did become a director himself in the 60s, and he's best known in the West for two horror films, Onibaba and Kuroneko. Onibaba is one of the great sort of uh, world cinema horror films that you should check out. It's about these two women living out in, it's in medieval Japan, and it's set during a time of civil war, and they're living out in the wilds, and they prey on lone soldiers who come within their reach, and they kill them and rob them. And there's an extraordinary sequence, which you'll never forget, an incredible image of a, a mask becoming affixed to this woman's face. It's one of the great images of horror cinema. He followed it up with a sequel a couple of years later called Kuroneku, again revolving around two women, but this time they're ghosts, they're kind of cat spirits, come back to take revenge on these samurai that killed them. So these are Shindo's most famous films. I would argue Shindo's best film as a director is a film called The Naked Island. This is a rather neglected film these days, though it is available on Criterion. And this is an extraordinary movie. He made it in the early 60s, and it's about a family. It's a sort of almost near-realist film, watching this family eke out this existence on this island in the middle of a lake. And across the lake is a modern town. But they're living almost a medieval feudal lifestyle, trying to, you know, make agri an agricultural living out of this island. And the whole film is done with virtually no dialogue. It is a near-realist portrait of these people, the nitty-gritty day-to-day life of these people on this island and the incredible difficulties and hardship they face. It sounds hard work. It's incredibly beautiful and very moving and beautifully shot. It's a real masterpiece and it's a shame that it's relatively neglected these days. OK, we can't put it off any longer. We're talking about the Japanese new wave. Let's talk about the main guy, Nagisa Oshima the angriest director in world cinema. Once when he was interviewed, uh, Oshima was asked, what is it you don't like about Japanese film? And he said, all of it. <laughs> this is the ultimate cinematic rebel, the ultimate angry young man. There's an anger, a fury that powers all of Oshima's work. He, he really challenged almost every social assumption in Japan. But there's also a restless experimentation no one Ozu film is like another. He kind of constantly kept, you know, clawing at cinema, pushing it around, trying different things. An extraordinary director. He's best known in the West for his mid-period work, Ai no Corridor in the Realm of the Senses, which is one of the great extreme sex movies of the 70s, you know, sense-abating movies, where this prostitute and her client hole up in this house Again, in a completely interior set film, they hold up in this house having sex with each other in an increasingly sadomasochistic relationship while war starts to ferment outside. It's an incredible film. He's also known for Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, an English language film he made with David Bowie as an intern in a POW camp. Actually, one of his less interesting films, I'm going to be honest. He also made a film in the 80s with Charlotte Rampling having a relationship with an ape, Max Mon Amour. It's great. But his best work um, is in the 60s and 70s, where films like Ceremonies, an extraordinary film, looking at the life of this young man purely through the ceremonies and rituals, weddings, funerals, etc., of his family. Extraordinary film. Boy, a brilliant neo-realist portrait of this young lad who is used by his parents what they do is they force him to go out into the road and pretend a car has hit him, pretend he's had a traffic accident, so that they can sue for compensation from the driver. And it's a portrait of him in this, this dreadful life. It's, a, it's an absolutely wrenching, brilliant film. Diary of a Shinjuku Thief, which is his most Godardian film, his most formally vig you know, uh, radical film with beautiful red colour, you know, sort of eye-watering colour. My personal favourite of this period from, is from very early in the 1960s. He made a film called Night and Fog in Japan. Now, I will admit this is quite a heavy movie, especially for a Western audience, because it does require 
some knowledge of Japanese history and particularly Japanese political history in the post-war period because it's a film about the left, uh, about the left that was opposed to the American occupation, opposed to militarism, but also opposed to the way that America was interacting with the Japanese government and you know more and more American interference. But it's also about how this left implodes, how they start infighting against each other. And it's all done through an allegory of a relationship between a leftist and this other, this other person coming from a different political angle. And the way Oshima treats this subject throughout the film is extraordinary. He almost pushes it into avant-garde territory. You have characters declaiming to camera. You have flashbacks that are entered into th th these, th the party is having a meeting and they split and then they start declaiming to each other and you go into flashbacks that almost have a sort of avant-garde, surrealist style. It's heavy going, but it's an extraordinary film. I don't think any other film I've ever seen so brilliantly delineates the implosion of a political group. I think it does that brilliantly. It's one of the great political films, actually. Just before I leave Oshima, check out his very last film that he made in 1999, shortly before he died. It's a very neglected film, and it's a very brilliant one. It's called Gohato, or in English, Taboo. Again, it's a samurai film. It goes back into period. And it's a sort of reworking of the Billy Bud story um, about how this young samurai comes to the, 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 um, the samurai school and he's very beautiful and people start to become attracted to him and it starts envy and jealousy in the ranks. And Beat Takeshi Kitano, who's a famous director and actor in his own right, he plays the head, he plays the chief teacher in this academy who realises he's got a problem on his hands and that the presence of this young, beautiful youth is going to shatter their stability. It's a fantastic movie. If you can get hold of it, it's well worth watching. Another key figure in the early 60s, though, was Masaki Kobayashi. Now, he's best known in the West for two very different projects. In the late 50s, he made The Human Condition, a three-part film, uh, one of the great anti-war films. Um, and then later on in the 60s, he made Kwaidan. Now, Kwaidan, if you've never seen it, is a portmanteau ghost story film. So it's made up of four different ghost stories. It is visually one of the most beautiful films ever made. It is lick the screen gorgeous with images that you will never forget. A, a man tattooed head to toe in the Japanese calligraphy and just extraordinary images. Just for its beauty alone, it's worth watching. But actually my favourite Kobayashi film is a film he made in, in 62 called Harakiri. Again, we go back to the world of the Japanese samurai. and But it's not really a Chanbara movie. It's not an, an action movie with loads of sword fighting. There is a sword fight at the end, and it's beautifully balletic, almost fantastical in the way it's filmed. But actually, this is a samurai film where all the action is interior and claustrophobic. A wandering samurai, a ronin, turns up at a samurai academy. And he demands to be allowed to commit seppuku, or harakiri. This is the traditional suicide where you stab yourself and then wrench the blade across to disembowel yourself. And according to the laws of samurai, he has to be allowed in to do this. But once he's in, and so much of the action is set in the courtyard of this samurai academy, it's very concentrated, he, re he starts to reveal who he really is. Someone who's taken revenge for another ronin, a wandering samurai, who came to the academy a few months ago and was forced into committing seppuku. And it becomes this tense battle of wills between this one man and this entire academy surrounding him, a battle over the ethics and responsibilities of the samurai. So it's this intense claustrophobic drama, a, a drama of words, where, where violence is always on the cusp of happening. It's an extraordinarily intense film. I've never seen anything quite like it. Brilliant story. It was remade in recent years. Um, and the film, the remake, is by Miyiki, Takashi Miyiki, is very good. But it doesn't quite have the strange power of um, the original by uh, Kobayashi. 
Another major figure who appeared in the early 60s was Shohei Imamura. Now, Imamura is a director I've never really got on with. His challenge to Japanese society was more by going down to the lower ranks, you know, looking at the underbelly of society, almost the animalistic side of society. If you watch his film, The Profound Desires of the Gods, he watches as this outsider from Tokyo, this engineer, he goes to this remote Japanese island and he gets involved with this family who are almost inbred. He gets involved with a daughter and they have an almost... It's almost like a sort of... He descends into barbarism, into this kind of pantheistic world. It's a very strange film, very beautifully shot and interesting, well worth your time, but very odd. He also made a very interesting film called A Man Vanishes, a sort of documentary stroke essay film. Um, a lot of people each year go vanish, vanish in Japan. It's a strange phenomenon. And he takes one case of this, this perfectly ordinary guy who vanishes and he watches two years after the event as his wife and his family try to find him. It's quite a, a strange, disconcerting film if you can track it down. But the reason I mention Imamura in this video is because Imamura made one of the great Japanese new, new wave films, The Insect Woman. This is an extraordinary film. It's not, I'm afraid, a creature feature, as its title might suggest, unfortunately. But it is an absolutely brilliant, harrowing, first-rate, near-realist portrait of this woman who's born into rural poverty, and who by accident, exploitation, and sometimes by design, rises up through the ranks of Japanese society. The final image of this film will stay with you for a very, very long time. It's a brilliant, brilliant film. Very tough, very harsh. Again, getting rid of the sort of the politeness of the old Japanese golden age films and showing a ruthless new world of Japan coming into being in the 1960s. It reminds me a lot, you know, The Insect Woman, of the British novel of the 1700s and early 1800s. Things like, you know, what Henry Fielding used to write, like Mole Flanders and Tom Jones. These stories of people who come from nothing and who through their sheer cunning and device and, you know, attractiveness and whatever, manage to get their way up into polite society. A kind of picaresque journey. That's what The Insect Woman is. Now, a figure who appeared towards the end of the 60s, um, and I think is a major director, even though he only has two major feature films to his name, he then went on to a career of making short films, is Toshio Matsumoto. Now, in the late 60s, he made a film called Funeral Parade of Roses. This is an extraordinary film, which anyone interested in Japanese cinema should watch. It's based in the world of the gay hostess bar in Tokyo, and it follows the fortunes of um, this owner of a, a gay bar, a transvestite, who employs other transvestites. And a new young transvestite called Eddie appears, and they start a relationship. And the current partner of the main character is being ousted, so there's a kind of love triangle there. That doesn't give you any clue as to how this film works. This film is like, it's so fresh. So original, so daring, so formally aggressive and extraordinary. You just don't know where it's going to go next. It's incredible. It's like cinema that's broken loose and can go and do whatever it wants. I mean, it feels fresh now in 2023. Imagine watching it in 1968 or 69 in a Tokyo cinema. It must have felt like a bomb going off. It's absolutely incredible. About three years later, he made another film, this is quite hard to find, but it's well worth tracking down. In English, it's called Pandemonium, sometimes called Demons, which is a crap title. Pandemonium is much better. Now, this, again, is a samurai film. It's a Jidegeki film based on a kabuki play. And what Matsumoto does is he keeps the staginess deliberately of the play. It's all set in interior sets with very... Chiroscuro, almost noirish lighting, very strong shadows. So it's got a very oppressive, claustrophobic feel. Like you're in hell, pandemonium. And it's about this, again, a ronin who wants to buy his way into a samurai clan and his money is stolen by a geisha and he decides to take revenge. So it's a 
samurai revenge drama, but that doesn't give any feeling for how it works as a film. As a film, it's it's a, an intensely claustrophobic interior experience, almost verging towards a kind of avant-gardism, you know, where you know the realism gets stripped away for an intense sort of theatrical experience. I've never seen anything like it. I've only been able to see it once, unfortunately, so I'd, I'd give a better description of it if I'd seen it many times, but I know that it's well worth tracking down. Now, the last director I want to discuss in this video today is a director who I've, re I've been discovering more and more of in recent years, and I've begun to realise is one of the great directors, not just of Japanese cinema, but of world cinema, but he's very neglected in the West. His name is Kiju Yoshida. He was known in the 60s as Yoshishigi Yoshida, but he changed his name. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Now, weirdly, if he's known at all in the West, he's known for this, his political trilogy, which extraordinarily is available on this beautiful box set from Arrow in the UK. Now, the reason I say extraordinarily is because this is Yoshida's most difficult work. You know, like I was saying about Night and Fog in Japan by Oshima, to really get to understand these films, you need to have a very good understanding of Japanese history, and particularly its political history. All three of the films in this box set, which is well worth getting, by the way, they, are, they deal with pivotal moments in Japanese political history, movements or outsider figures or rebels, and how they interact with society and how that society eventually sort of crushes their ideals or they come unstuck. So the middle film, for example, of this trilogy, which I happen to think is the best, Heroic Purgatory, that deals with the same material that Oshima was dealing with in Night and Fog in Japan, the implosion, the infighting of the left in the face of the American occupation and the post-war Japanese world. But he takes it to an even more stylized, even more avant-garde, extreme than Oshima. Yoshida is an extraordinary director. Every single shot is a very extreme uh, composition so that you have a character very far down in the bottom of the screen and then a sort of geometry and architecture behind them. That The framing is very radical in every single shot. It's relentless. It's quite hard going. You know, you really have you know, he's forcing you to think about every shot and the relationship of the actor to actor or actor to environment in every single shot. But if you're prepared to sit with it, it's an incredible experience. Eros Plus Massacre, the first film in this trilogy, is about four hours long. It deals with a proto-feminist um, in the early years of the 20th century, though he said he was a proto-feminist, proto -feminist, but his relationships with women were rather questionable. <laughs> And this is a four-hour film that even brings sort of modern-day Tokyo and Japan into this telling of a story set in the 1910s. The final film, Coup d'etat, is more realistic, but is even more trenchant, I think, in its political observation. Very, very good film about some sort of um, almost right-wing radicals trying to overthrow the state. But the thing about Yoshida is, though his most difficult films... But there is an earlier Yoshida from the 1960s. I saw a film of his from 1962 called Akitsu Springs, and it blew my mind. It's kind of like a Japanese Wuthering Heights, a very intense romantic relationship between these two people told in really thick, gorgeous colours. And what Yoshida does is he ramps up the melodrama and the romance to an extreme, so it almost becomes unreal, almost surreal. And it works. You know, it, it's so radically done that it, it actually becomes something very moving and powerful and stark instead of treacly or, you know, Mills and Booney. And I became interested in this because it was one of the first films he made with his later wife, Okada Mariko. And they made a series of films together together in the 60s, that I've begun to realise, I'm starting to see them, is one of the best groups of films in world cinema and the most neglected. They're extraordinary and they're well worth checking out. Some Western critics have compared um, 
Yoshida with Antonioni. He's actually quite a different director, but I see where they're coming from. A director who deals in extreme stylization and who works closely with one actress, just as Antonioni works with Monica Vitti. And there is an element of that in Yoshida's work with Okada Mariko. And I think these films really need to be rediscovered. I think they're a sort of lost, you know, holy grail of world cinema. Well, those are the directors that I wanted to look at in this new wave. There are other directors like Masamura, who are very important, but that, that's a starting place for you. Next time, I'm going to be looking uh, from the sort of 1980s through to the present day. I hope you've enjoyed this content. If you have, please like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.